Damn, I wish I had some salt and vinegar chips. Hi, hello, welcome and welcome back to my channel. My name is Jess. Today we're going to be getting a little salty. Recently, Lee Bardugo revealed the cover of King of Scars number two, which is called Rule of Wolves. And I have some thoughts about the cover and it just brought up all my feelings that I still have from King of Scars that came out last year. So I felt like making a video. I'm going to go ahead and give a warning though. If you have not read the Grisha trilogy, that's Shadow and Bone trilogy, if you haven't read the Six of Crows duology, and if you haven't read King of Scars, I wouldn't recommend you watch this video if you plan on reading those because there will be spoilers for all of them. So that's your warning. And also, all the following statements in this video are my opinion. That's all I'm gonna say. So if you didn't read King of Scars, and you don't plan on reading it, I'll give you a brief synopsis. So, Lee Bardugo wrote the Grishaverse trilogy that Shadow and Bone, Siege and Storm, and Rage and... Ruin and Rising. <laughs> and the Grishaverse trilogy, there's a character, a side character named Nikolai, who is the best character of that trilogy, hands down. That's not an opinion, that's a fact, okay? Period. Period nothing left to say like period. period and so after that she wrote the six of crows duology which is amazing and a million times better than the grisha verse trilogy i like the grisha verse trilogy but the main characters and kind of the story overall were just okay six of crows duology amazing and nikolai makes like a slight cameo in crooked kingdom i believe he's not really in the book and then so all these years my friend kara and i who love nikolai more than anyone else don't try to fight us on it we're always like gosh nikolai deserves his own book nikolai deserves his own series and then finally was it 2018 it was announced lee bardugo announced she was writing the nikolai duology she called it that. If I could find receipts, I'll post them, but I swear she called it that. She's like, Nikolai's getting his own story. And then we found out it was called King of Scars, and I was so pumped. And I started literally counting down. I downloaded one of those stupid countdown apps and put it on my phone. I was so hyped. I was posting updates to Instagram all the time, just thinking about this amazing story that Nikolai was going to get. And then we got this. We got this instead okay it is a beautiful beautiful cover i hope you can see that this is uh my copy that i have tabbed and all my notes and i did get the illumicrate edition um because again i was so excited for this book and then i read it so this book is about 500 pages and going into it i thought this was about nikolai and obviously there's going to be side characters Lee had announced before the book came out that there was going to be one of the Six of Crows characters. We found out it was Nina. I loved Nina in the Six of Crows duology, so I was here for it. And also Zoya from the original Grishaverse trilogy was going to be in this book. So I was, I was like, I love those ladies. I'm ready. I reread the Grishaverse trilogy. I reread Six of Crows duology. I was ready. I had all the information. Now Lee also said that she wrote King of Scars to so that it could be readable to anyone who didn't read the Grishaverse trilogy or the Six of Crows duology. And I feel like that is false because this book really reads like Grishaverse 4. Like basically picking up after Ruin and Rising left off. I totally feel that. And I feel like you really did need to read both of those series before reading this one because there's so many mentions of the other series. It is very much a continuation of the Grishaverse trilogy and I will die on that hill, okay? I will start first with the things that I did like about the book. I obviously liked that there was more Nikolai, regardless of it to me not seeming like the book was focused on him, I was happy to see him again even if he wasn't the same Nikolai that was in the Grishaverse trilogy. I also did love Zoya. I didn't love her when I first read the Grishaverse trilogy, then I reread it and I appreciated her character more. So I did really love her for the majority of this book. I also did love seeing Nina because like I said, I did enjoy her in Six of Crows. Um, I liked seeing her grief from the death of Matthias and I thought that was handled really well. I liked, there was like really cool technology in this one, obviously the, the political intrigue, which honestly seemed kind of a back burner and you think it would have been more in the forefront but it looks like that's going to be more of a focus in the second book. I was really happy to see like Genya or Genya, is it Genya? 
and David, Tolia and Tamar. Um, I was really happy to see them, even if it was only for a little bit. We did get some aspects of Nikolai's and Zoya's backstory, and I really enjoyed those parts, kind of learning about them and kind of what fuels Zoya and her attitude kind of now, the way that she is and part of Nikolai's backstory. So I really did enjoy that. But overall, those were my top things that I did like. So I didn't hate the book completely, but I was expecting a five star read and it was a two. On Goodreads, I did give it a three, but it needs to be downgraded to a two. Now, what I didn't like, so I said before that I did like Nina in this story. Her point of view, so there were four points of view in this book. We had Nikolai, Zoya, Nina, and then we got this stupid one from Isak, which I'll get to. But Nina's point of view, at first I was so excited because obviously at the end of Crooked Kingdom, Matthias died. That was her bae. And so at the beginning of this book, we get to see her dealing with that grief and that loss and her um, traveling to, what, Fjorda to bury him. Um, so that was handled really well. I was really like in my feelings about that. And then she... From there, you're waiting for her point of view to intersect with Nikolai and Zoya, who are in Ravka, and it doesn't. Now, I know in the second book it probably will, but I'm just saying I felt no connection between the, the points of views there and the different locations and how they fit together in the story. It would be like Nikolai and Zoya chapters, especially once you got to the midpoint and then further on and things are really happening and then we go to Nina and it just seemed to kill the pacing because her parts just were a lot slower and again had nothing really to do with that other part of the story so it felt weird like it felt like her story should have been a novella on its own I just didn't mesh well and I read this book last year I do have my Goodreads review and tabs so I apologize if I'm not completely accurate but she was doing this whole other thing with women who were pregnant and being fed Jerda Parem and trying to figure out like she's on this like infiltration mission but I still don't really get how that deals with what Nikolai is going through and the impending battle between um is it Ravka and Fjorda. I just feel like I couldn't appreciate her storyline that much because I was like I just want to get back to the other point of view because I don't see what this has to do with it. And I also didn't like that we first saw Nina grieving over Matthias and then this in her wherever she is in this new place. Is it Fjorda again? She meets so there's this girl Han, Hannah, Hanny, whatever her name is and she is very much Matthias but a girl. She is surly and off you know putting she doesn't like Nina. She is very uh Fjordan and looks down on Grisha and over time warms up to Nina and it looks like there's a romance budding there and I don't like that at all. I'm like girl you just buried your boo and now you already moved on to the female version of her. Him. Why can't Nina like anybody who likes her? Like likes who she is. A oh, Grisha. Why is she falling in love with these Grisha hating people? I'm tired of that. And then oh plot twist. Her dad is Jarl Brum, you know, the villain from the freaking from Six of Crows. I'm like, can can Nina just find somebody who's not a freaking hater, a Grisha hater? I don't like it. I don't like that whole, I don't like it. Mm -mm. Maybe it's not going into a romance. It totally is though. I don't like it. Like I appreciate you showing, you know, that she's bisexual, uh, but no, I don't want it. No, thank you. So it will be interesting in the next one to see what happens with that whole Jerda Parim, pregnant ladies, whatever happens with Nina. And I'm really hoping that it fits into the main story better. But in King of Scars, it just felt really disjointed and I was not here for it. In my review originally, I was feeling like I was on the Nikolai and Zoya ship because Lee is definitely writing it in that way or it seems so, but they have no chemistry. The longer I thought about it, I was like, no, it's not a slow burn. There's a no burn. There's no, the flame is, there's no flame to begin with. They don't know because you have all these quotes on Zoya being this strong, independent woman who don't need no man. She don't want to be queen, okay? She don't need no ring on her finger. But also at the same time, setting it up like her, like there's lines about her thinking about Nikolai or Nikolai thinking about her. But it's like... I think that's a big YA thing. Everybody doesn't have to be paired up. Just let them be. Zoya don't need no man, okay? And I don't like where that's going. I really hope they don't end up together because they don't fit. They are great friends. 
they are great co-workers <laughs> but as lovers uh, 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 no no there was a fourth pov of this esoc and i totally can't remember who he is but they basically get some random dude him and he's a nikolai impersonator and the I mean, I, did it make sense in the story? I guess, but we didn't need a POV from him. I would have preferred that from like, I don't know, Jenya or just not having it. I, I hated it. I was just like hurrying up through his chapter. Like, can we move on with this? Just another POV that just really threw off the pacing of this 500 page book that really didn't start picking up till like over the halfway point. That's a problem. So obviously, Nikolai is the king of Ravka and with kingdoms you always need like a marriage alliance or something and so it looks like he's going to be marrying a shoe princess and I'm just like not a fan. I don't know if there's anyone perfect for Nikolai. If Lee could write the right woman that he deserves but that ain't it but it looks like it may happen because he needs a political alliance to stand against Fjorda. So we'll see what happens there. Now, once we get to the midpoint is where I really start getting mad because she basically upended her whole magic system in her world and I don't appreciate it. So Nikolai, Zoya, and this overzealous monk, what's his name, Yuri, who is basically like the leader of the Starless One cult, which is a leader, which is a cult that is obsessed with the Darkling who died at the end of the Grishaverse trilogy. I don't know, I don't remember what circumstances led them to going to the fold together, but they all travel to the fold together and Yuri, Nikolai, and Zoya disappear into this sand castle in the middle of the fold somehow. If you remember, the fold was that big old thing of darkness that the Darkling created. And what do they find in the sand castle? The gods. They've just been living in the sand castle in the middle of the fold. So there's like what, Elisabetta, Grigori, Juris, um, all the saints that have been mentioned in the previous books, but in real life. I was like, okay, where are we gonna go with this? And <laughs> what happens in this damn sand castle pisses me off. If you remember, at the end of the Grishaverse trilogy, um, Nikolai is basically infected with like one of the Darklings demon things and so he goes between being normal Nikolai and this thing coming out of him and turning to like this evil bird bat thing that flies around. So I'm thinking we're going into this book and that is going to be solved by the end of this book but that is false. It is not. So Elisabetta is like Oh, we can help get that out of you, but you gotta call, you know, you gotta call the darkness and we're gonna pull it out. Basically, we're gonna exercise this demon out your ass, Nikolai. We're gonna get it out. False. They set him up, okay? So they're in this sandcastle for I don't know how long. It seemed like forever. They're working with Nikolai to like call this darkness out of him. Like he's gotta he's gotta go down to this deep dark place to be able to call it out. And then Zoya is on the side. She's training with Juris, who's basically like a dragon god thing, and um, truly training with her Grisha power. Now, if you remember, the Grisha have orders. There's three Grisha verse orders, and excuse my pronunciation, I can never say them right, but there's Corporalki, Etheralki, and Material materialki wow cannot say those so you have different orders everyone under the different order has a certain amount of power so if you're a grisha you fall into one of those that's it you do your thing this person does their thing oh no 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 not no more because what you really need to do you just need to look within and you just need to train a little harder and you can access all the powers honey basically that's what she said in this book because so we had always believed that you were born your order and that was it. But now in this book, uh, Zoya working with Juris, it's kind of like she's like gaining strength and becoming a more powerful Grisha. And now after Elisabetta has tricked Nikolai, because I said they were trying, telling him that they were trying to get the darkness out of him, well false. They were trying to basically take his body and put the darkling in it, if I remember that correctly. And so he's in this compromised position. So Zoya's like, hold up. I need backup. She runs to Juris, who Elizaveta's trifling ass has poison, and he's like, um, he's like, take my body and you're gonna be powerful. And she is like, you said it was corruption, only if you give nothing of yourself in return. A little faith, Zoya, that is all this requires. A bitter laugh escaped her. I don't have it. 
There is no end to the power you may obtain. The making at the heart of the world has no limit. It does not weaken. It does not tire. But you must go to meet it. So false. Even if you're born a heart render, you too can become a squalor. All you got to do is go look for it. You got to dig a little deeper. She's thinking and she, I mean, she does basically take his body and she's like, but what was she to do now? She wasn't a fabricator. That was Elisabetta's gift. Are we not all things? So now they all things. Now they everybody. Now they can do everything. Okay, Lee. All right. It'd be different if she set that up in the original trilogy like that. But I don't like her changing that now all these books in. I don't like that. No. At the same time that it seemed like they were in the sandcastle for a long time, also didn't seem like a long time because there's so many POV jumps. Zoya and Nikolai's training, it just it seemed like a montage. It seemed to go really quickly for Zoya to go in there and not have really of these other capabilities. And then now she's basically this all-powerful Grisha. So I'm like... Is she the most powerful Risha now? If you haven't read this, how did the Darkling come back to life? At the end of the Grisha trilogy, the Darkling is captured, burned, he's dead. Hooray! Alina gave away her power as a sun summoner to go live her little raggedy ass life with Mal, but the Darkling is dead, the world is saved. <laughs> no, no, he's not dead. Apparently, Elisabetta and her beehive ass switched bodies, snuck him away, and he's just been living as a damn honeycomb for the last three years or however long it's been. And she's just been waiting for the perfect time and the perfect body to bring the Darkling back. She said, I stole him from the sands of the fold and left a facsimile uh, in his place. It was well within my power. You preserved his body? In the hopes that he might be resurrected, I stored him in my hives. But they really brought uh, the Darkling back. They're saying he's the true king of Rock Ravka. His spirit lived on. He needed, it is only in need of a vessel. And so Yuri, that little raggedy ass monk, now has the spirit of the Darkling in him. Love that, love that, love that. Going into this next book, I'm just really worried of what it's going to be because we know from the Grisha trilogy originally Zoya followed the Darkling. She was team Darkles and now, you know, she saw the error of her ways and she has come to the light. But now she's this powerful Grisha dragon and the Darkling is back and I'm like, is she going to join his side? I, it could be because earlier she was like, like Zoya the dragon rumble. Let's see. Open the door, connect your past to your future. You are the conduit, Zoya. You will bring the Grisha back to what they were meant to be before time and tragedy corrupted their power, but only if you can open the door. Back to their power. That's that same fuck shit the Darkles was on. I don't know. I don't like the setup. I'm nervous. I don't like it. I don't like it. I hope this was somewhat coherent. Um, but I just can't believe that she killed Darkles at the end of the Grisha trilogy. Her main character lost her power to sacrifice and save the world. And then she's like, I'm writing a new series. Should I write a new villain? No, I'll just bring back an old one. The resurrection trope is tired already within a series but now these books later on this book that's supposed to stand on its own and you bring back the villain from the previous trilogy somebody somebody help what lazy i'm sorry i'm not a writer it is work to write a book i know but it's not like she was out here starving needed to get this book out to eat okay lee has been eating okay she got that coin so if it would have taken her some more time to give us a real good villain, a new villain, fine. We can wait. Nobody knew Nikolai was getting another book. You could have sat on that tea. You should have just sat there and quiet. ate your food. You could have been quiet. But no, you were like, oh no, I want this out. And I'm just going to bring back the Darkling. That's trifling to me. I'm sorry. That's trifling. He should have stayed dead. Because now, this is a duology. He either has to be killed again or he stays alive. Both why i'm just i'm just so i'm so i'm still mad okay i read this book like last year i'm still mad anytime i look at this shelf anytime i think of what nikolai deserved and what he got i'm so mad she 
She really brought back the, she really brought back the Darkling. I just can't believe it. Those are my main complaints. And also in all of that, I think the additional POVs really took away from Nikolai. He was not, he didn't feel like the main character in the story. He really felt like a side character. Zoya felt like the main character and then Nina and then Nikolai. And he didn't always seem like himself. He wasn't as sassy and witty. He just, and obviously he has the darkness inside of him. He has a lot going on. He's worried about his country, but he just wasn't the same Nikolai. And I saw someone's review that said that, that he is good only as a side character, that he's not, he doesn't have enough depth to be a main character. And that falls on the author. She wrote him as a side character. So if he was only enough for little, you know, one liners and just his little sass on the side, then it should have stayed like that. I mean, was I happy to get a Nikolai book? Yes, but I didn't want it to be this. So if she couldn't fully like flesh him out to make him stand on his own as the main character, then don't write it. But you know, I don't want to say it's greed, but It also comes with managing expectations because had it not been Nikolai is getting his own book, the Nikolai duology, Nikolai, Nikolai, Nikolai is called King of Scars. That is Nikolai, Cool Resny, that is him. Um, and I also have read that that is not a direct translation in Russian, but I obviously don't know Russian, but you know, I'm just saying you marketed it as that and it's just instead of a continuation. And so what I expected was not what I got. I expected essential water and I got the sun like expectations so I don't know will I read rule of wolves yes okay I will because I want to know what happens but I definitely am managing my expectations because they are here they're on the ground so anything better than that will be a win do I have high hopes not really um but I am interested to see where this story goes and how she wraps it up. I'm so salty. And when I hold a grudge, it's for a long time. And I know she's mentioned in passing that she will eventually write a Six of Crows 3. And at this point, I'm like, I kind of don't want you to. I think that, I don't want to say this, but was, was Six of Crows and Crooked Kingdom like her peak? Because, spoiler alert, Ninth House wasn't it either. Trash. That's another video. But yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, it was too long. The pacing was off. Nina's story felt disjointed. Nikolai wasn't the center of his own book. Zoya is now this big, powerful Grisha dragon who has all capabilities. The Darkling is back and he's in the body of a fucking monk. I just, uh, it's a lot. Let me know in the comments. Do you agree with anything I said? Do you disagree? Like, let me know. If you liked this video, like it. Hell, if you disliked it, dislike it. But tell me why. Let me know why you didn't like this video. I hope it's not the sound. I'm trying to be louder. I don't have a mic yet. It's, it's, it's coming, I promise. But yeah, please talk to me about your opinions. I know I'm not the only one who is disappointed in this book. So I need y'all to tell me your feelings. Um, also subscribe because if you like this salty energy, it will be around. All my social media is linked in the description along with petitions and GoFundMes for all sorts of things because the world is fucking awful. It seems to get worse every day. I'm tired. I'm so tired. But I feel like there's not a lot we can do, but we can do these things. We can share, we can sign, we can donate what we can. And we'll just have to do our best. So I will link these books in the description. If you, I am an affiliate with bookshop.org. So if you buy any books through the link, I would get a small commission. Thank you. If you do, don't feel bad if you don't. My description box is usually filled with a lot of stuff. So always check that out. But again, thank you for watching. Please wash your hands, wash your mask, wear your mask, wear sunscreen, stay hydrated, put on some chapstick, put on some lotion. Damn, like stay moisturized people. Anyway, thank you for watching. I'm so aggravated right now. I need to eat. I've just pissed myself off talking about this damn book. So I'm out. Toodles. Regardless of my feelings, I love this shelf because these books are beautiful. These are obviously my favorites. There's Kaz and Nikolai. Alchemy and Ink had some of my favorite candles. I don't think she makes candles like this anymore, but oh, I love them and they smell good. I have duplicates of these to burn. <laughs> but yeah, there's my Lee Bardugal shelf. I don't know why she got her own shelf, but it is what it is. Bye!
These are good as hell. I just, they really 